it's kind of what the topic is about. Like when you go to a movie and you're enjoying the movie, you're not bored because you can't interact with the movie, but you're going to be bored if it's if it's a bad movie. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Eric break away from our usual rants about cutscenes to talk about what makes for good cutscenes and what they can bring to a game. Plus, Yakuza 6, Fortnite, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. That's Backward-Compatible.com, Jim. Oh, damn. Already. Well, as you can probably tell, uh, we don't have Chris here with us today, um, but it's I'm here. It's chaos and anarchy. <laughs> uh, we, have th- we have three people here. I'm here. I'm Jim. Um, also, we have Eric. Hello. And we have Doc. Hey, everybody. Um, and today, we're actually going to talk about... We've actually been playing a lot of games, so we're going to talk about... Um, Yakuza 6, Fortnite, you know, some other games I'm sure are going to creep in here. And for our meaty topic today, we're going to um, actually talk about cinematics and games and what makes a good cinematic and uh, kind of talking from the other side of it because a lot of times we talk about why we don't like cinematics in games. I'm excited about this. Yeah, yeah. Very, I have, I have a lot so. to say about cinematics. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but first, we're going to start off with the button mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I've been kind of sequestering myself playing Yakuza 6, The Song of Life. Is that what? a commentary or is it the actual subtitle? It is, The Song of Life. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. Have all the others have subtitles or is it just they actually one? They actually have, but we don't get the subtitles here in the West. Oh, interesting. So, really? for a little background about Yakuza, the Yakuza series is a massive franchise in Japan. They have yearly releases of the series in Japan, and they have since, I believe, 2005, I think, was when the first one came out. Long running. Yeah. So, and they're not always main entries in the franchise. There's there's various spinoffs or remakes, but Yakuza 6 is the swan song of the series. This is the last Yakuza with Kiru Kazuma, the main character from the very beginning of the games. And my love affair with Yakuza really only started last year. I started playing um, Yakuza 0 and Yakuza Kiwami that came to the West on PS4. I never played them before, and I just fell in love with the games. But as we know from the God of War series, you can always just bring out a son, <laughs> walk them through the process, and always have eternal sequels. So, so that's what that's what you're thinking here, but the way that they handle it in... And there is a, there is a child, by the way, in Yakuza 6. Called it. But oh. I'm glad you brought it up. The child, first of all, is an infant. And secondly, it's actually... That's how that works, Jim. <laughs> no, no, no. But but it's in God of War, it's, it's your, he follows you around. It's an actual kid. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. Right? There's a difference here. And then the other one is that it's not actually Kiru's son. In a way, it's his grandson. Okay. He is a grandfather. Is he his own grandpa or... No, no, no. It's, it's, it's the daughter of his... It's the son of his adopted daughter. I see. So it's not oh, okay. actually his biological child. That's what, what I'm getting at. But it is lineage-wise in terms of you know, her being adopted, it is his grandson. Okay, right? sure. So what I'm getting at here, so the game itself uh, takes place in Japan, and it's it's uh, developed and published by Sega. Um, and essentially, it's this, this weird mixture of um, GTA mixed with a heavy storytelling, and I'm talking lots of cinematics, lots of cutscenes, very dramatic, um, plus a lot of the exploration elements and minigame elements that you might find in a Shinmu game. Mm. The the game takes place in two different cities. So one is uh, Cam- uh, Camarocho, which is I, I'm sure I'm bitching that pronunciation, but it's kind of like the in Tokyo. It's sort of like the Tokyo Las Vegas. Okay, kind of like the Sin City. Lots of gambling, lots of um, uh, cabarets that are in the city. And then the other city that you go to is this small little hamlet called Onomichi, which is uh, apparently in part of Hiroshima, and it's this like small fishing village. So you have these two very different cities that you kind of switch off between based on the storyline. People that have played the series a lot will notice this game is now in a new engine known as the Dragon Engine. And because of that, they were a little bit rushed when they put it together. Mm-hmm. But uh, the combat system has removed a lot, of, a lot of the combos that players might be familiar with. And part of that is because they haven't been able to incorporate them into the new engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the RPG system, the game does have um, 
statistics, various statistics like um, attack, agility, um, charm, technique, and spirit. And they all do different things. You use them to level up your stats. You gain them in various ways uh, throughout the game based on which ones that you're using. You also get, unlock a lot of special abilities, things like that. But the game itself is actually only partly about combat. The combat system is almost there to make you feel like you are Kiryu the badass. And I honestly have not had any trouble with any of the combat. It's kind of there almost as a, a way to drive the story and make you feel a part of it. Is that his subtitle or your uh, commentary? That's my commentary. Oh, okay. And he, he's actually the dragon of uh, Dojima, which is oh, where he's from. Oh. Uh, so he does have a really cool subtitle. He does himself. have a cool subtitle. Yeah. Right. Um, so I don't want to uh, get into too much detail about the story. I will say that um, I have seen some reviews that have said, oh, this is a great place to start on the series. I vehemently disagree with that. Hmm. This is the final episode with uh, Kazuma. I feel like you need to at least play um, Kawami, which is the remake of the first game, and possibly even Zero. It'd be great if you could play like the second game or the third or, or the uh, fifth game that came right before this, but I didn't, and I was able to catch up just fine. They have a, re uh, a mode in the game that lets you kind of review the different, mm. the different stories if you need to. Um, the reason I suggest playing at least the first game is because I've noticed a lot of callbacks to the first game the writers have done a really good job of intentionally making the story feel like it's gone full circle and bringing back a lot of the characters including characters from what they call sub stories which are like the side quests in the game mm. completely optional but always the most fun of the game always very wacky and weird and crazy but have a really cool philosophical point to them and they brought back a lot of them and some of these people that you encountered and were horrible people are back and sometimes they're still horrible people and sometimes they've changed hmm. and sometimes they've changed for not really a good reason but you sort of feel like you can forgive them. Like there's this weird kind of sense of, of, of karmic retribution um, to the game. And I feel like it's probably leading up to um, Kiru dying. I hope he doesn't, but it feels like it might be because the whole game feels almost like this is the redemption arc. And that's going to be my guess. Yeah, for yeah. Him. And I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll see. Um, but I will say that I'm enjoying this game a lot. And the story is very strong, despite having, I would say, some of the most, I'd say the most cutscene interruptions of any game series that I've played and enjoyed since Metal Gear Solid. Well, we'll talk about that in the meaty topic. Yeah. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. All right. Well, I have been playing, hold your breath, Fortnite. Uh I have been looking you, forward like to this everybody game. Everybody in the world, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. But I've been I've been looking forward to this game. Gosh, five years, six years since it was first announced, mm -hmm. basically. And of course, back then, uh, you know, I was a big Minecraft player, and so I saw it as the next stage of evolution of Minecraft because you had zombies, you were going to build forts, and it was going to get you away from the block thing and more into hmm. what we would think of as conventional uh, building and design. It's interesting that you you took that approach with it because I never really got that impression. Well, no, nowadays that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's because um, when it was first announced, it was a very, very different game. Now the art hasn't changed much, but uh, fundamentally, one aspect of gameplay has completely changed, and it is that even though it is still in dev right now, and you have to um, pay for early access, which that's a whole other rant that I'm just not going to get into. The free part of the game is a battle royale, and it is almost identical, one could say, to PUBG. Except, and this is a huge asterisk, for the building aspect, which has been at least partially preserved. Now, that said, that alone makes it almost completely unlike PUBG. Mm -hmm. And so that's worth noting. I think that in the same sense that you could compare, say, uh, Ultima Online to World of Warcraft as being just not even the same kind of thing, even though they were both MMOs. Uh, that is what Fortnite seems to have done, in my opinion, to this arena style battle. It's taken all the stuff that worked and then it has turned everything else comic and fun. So you can actually uh, get your head, uh, you know, blown off by a submachine gun and think it's funny instead of screaming and ranting and yelling uh, at your PUBG server guy who did this thing to you. It's actually quite a bit of fun. Now that said, there are some huge misconceptions about this game that I really want to just throw out there from the beginning. Misconception one, this is not a PVP fighting game. 
It's just not. It is a survival game. And so on a fundamental level, what you can do and probably should do the first couple of times you parachute in from the battle bus, which is as awesome as it sounds, <laughs> what you should really do is go to the far end of the map, wait till uh, the bus is about to kick you off at the last, call it two, three seconds, parachute out and then get as far away towards the edge of the map as you possibly can. And then get used to the controls, get used to finding stuff, get used to looting stuff, get used to building stuff and just watch as the player count drops. Because before you even land, like before you even hit the ground with your feet, you're going to start seeing messages of people who have been off by other people. And what that represents is those who jumped early, landed next to each other and axed each other in the head. So what you've got is uh, instead, when you start playing a different way, a how long can I survive game plan to sort of Keep track of how long you survive. And, and one way to do that is, um, you know, the player count, this is sort of obviously and built into the game, is the player count is if you can make it to the top uh, 25, you've done pretty well. If you can make it to the top 10, you get a multiplier. And that's actually really well. My best record so far is two. I was the I was mm. the second person alive, and I want to declare this straight from the start. I did that while only having to f defend myself one time <laughs> because I hid really, really well. And I got a little bit lucky with where the uh, the circles, the eye of the storm, it's called, mm -hmm. appear. There have been little tricks, and there's tons of videos on this, but um, little tricks they don't even tell you about. Like um, you can edit your controls so that you can do a quick build mode, which I think is fantastic. There's uh, what's called a, a quick, I think it's like fight mode, uh, which is also fantastic. And it's adjusting your controls based on it. Now I'm playing on PS4. So I'll throw that out there. There's about to ask that's, what yeah. system. So that's the big thing for me is that I want to make sure my controller works the way I want it to. You'll see people pop up into the air, look behind them and look back around before they land. That's how sensitive you can get this. And if you're really good at it, you can actually pop around, shoot somebody mm -hmm. pop before you even land and keep running. It's that kind of a thing. So that that's the sort of thing you want to practice while not expecting to win. Mm -hmm. So that's my huge advice for somebody who wants to get into the game and have some fun with it. So anyway... Um, I, I've been having a lot of fun with it. You can't beat the price of free. I'm really looking forward to when the main game is free um, because that's a much more survival-based, sort of team-based co-op thing um, akin to what some people played Minecraft as back in the day. And uh, we'll see. But that said, I think it's neat how the devs have really uh, adapted to the player space and knowing who their audience is and really giving us kind of what we've been asking for. Not me personally, because I never thought I would be interested mm -hmm. in a battle royale. Uh, in fact, I stood up in front of a class and said unequivocally that uh, they would never make Hunger Games into a game because of just the, the toxic environment of it being that. I was completely wrong about this idea of a battle royale mechanic working. I was totally wrong. It is actually right now, probably I would say the number one innovative, hot, evolving game mechanic. And I'm really interested to see where that goes. Cool. So yeah, cool. go, go check it out. Fortnite. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. I've been playing um, The Counter of Death. It is a mobile game available on um, both iOS and Android, and um, having a pretty good time with it, and I'll kind of explain what this game is. So essentially, it is almost a love letter to old kung fu films, particularly Bruce Lee films, and even more particularly, uh, the film The Game of Death. And if you've seen it, it's a film in which Bruce Lee mm -hmm. um, has to battle multiple um, masters of martial arts in a tower, and each, each level, each floor of that tower has another enemy. So it kind of follows that same structure. Um, you are a, a, a kung fu fighter, you're actually wearing a kung fu jacket, so you're quite particularly a kung fu fighter. And the way that you fight in this game, you have the top part of the screen is the action, and the bottom entire half of your screen are the buttons. You have an up button and a down button. And if you hit the up button, you counter, a, you counter as in block a move, attack from the top. And if you hit the down button, you attack a move from the bottom or counter move from the bottom. So it's all about countering, reading your opponent, and then automatically attacking, it does it for you, after you counter successfully. Hmm. Um, it's really, really, really simple, but it's really easy and quick in terms of what you have to do. And it's all about um, essentially like 
speed. Like how quickly can you counter because the enemies get faster, the way that they telegraph their moves um, is less obvious as you move on, you have less time to counter. Uh, I've only gotten up to the third floor so far, but I've only recently started playing. Um, but it's a fun game. It's from developer Curl King. Check it out. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Let's talk about a board game called Blood Rage. Blood Rage has actually been out for about a year. It was originally a Kickstarter. Um, and there's uh, some really unique things about it that I like. Now, just to set the stage, uh, the thing about Blood Rage is that it is Ragnarok, which is, of course, Viking Norse mythology, right? So you've got one of four different clans. It is a four-player game, though, as I understand it, there's a five-player expansion uh, either coming out or that is out. And, and, and these are these are all Viking clans, like different, yeah, clans. different Viking, like okay. Bear Clan or Wolf Clan, that kind of a thing. Um, and Raven there, Claw, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, there's no uh, Hufflepuff. There's no uh, difference mechanically in the clans. It's just the colors and the art. But the mm. art is really, really fantastic. That said, it is also Viking mythology. So what you have the option to bring in is mythological creatures to fight for your clan and. What you're oh, trying cool. to do, yeah, what you're trying to do is storm Ragnarok, the uh, the island on which the final judgment day is uh, going to occur. And what's neat is from the very beginning, you have two destroyed areas. So your map is going to be different, uh, kind of randomly different every time. And what... Uh, like the power-ups that you can get are different every time because of those are random as well. And then every turn, call, they're called ages. There are three ages in the game. Um, what happens is you uh, you destroy another segment. You know what's happening. It's not completely random. So it's kind of like it's it's got a laser, laser pointed at it. You know that's where the target's going. But... Um, you know, when when it is destroyed, then anybody who is in that area um, and and dies, you actually get bonus points for. So there's this weird, cool mechanic of when you send your units to Valhalla, you mostly can't get them back. There are ways out of it, but um, you know, mostly you can't get your units back. But you score points for them for the most part when you. Do. And it's about balancing uh, the cards that you have. So there's a draft where you have six, seven cards in your hand. You pick one, you pass. You pick one, you pass. Mm. You pick one, you pass. And so by the time you're done drafting it up, like, oh, Sushi Go is a great example mm -hmm. that uses that mechanic. What you have is hopefully a well-balanced enough hand of battle cards, mission cards, and upgrade cards that you can bring out the monsters you want to bring out. You can upgrade your clan the way you want to upgrade it. And you can also upgrade your hero. Your hero deploys for free. Your units cost rage to deploy. Anything that you want to upgrade costs rage to upgrade. So if you upgrade but don't have enough rage left to deploy, you have a problem. Then ultimately what you're after is pillaging the little villages that are all around on the island so that you can get power-ups so that you can increase your stats. If you get them all the way up, you get a bonus of either a, an additional uh, 10 that's called uh, glory or 20 glory at the end of the game. But there's lots of other ways to get glory throughout the game. The quests give you glory. Some of them are, uh, you know, have more than four units in Valhalla uh, before Ragnarok occurs. And some of them are, uh, have the most power in a certain area of the map, that kind of a thing. And then um, in the middle of it is Yggdrasil. And in that area, uh, that's uh, if you can claim that, if you can pillage that, you can actually get all three of your stats to go up at the same time. So that one's hotly contested and everybody sort of dogpiles in. Because anytime you pillage, anybody in an adjacent space can move their units in with you to contest it. And so that's one of the beautiful mechanics of this game is that you are actually not building up armies to try to win so much as you are building up armies to try to pillage. And then when they are eventually defeated and killed, you want them to die gloriously in battle. So they'll go to Valhalla and hopefully uh, work towards some kind of a mission that you're on or a quest that you're on. 
build these combos, these really phenomenal combos that allow you to just get massive points at the end of the game. And one of the players actually just blew out like 40 points just straight out of the end. And it was really, really cool the way that it was done in a completely unexpected way. Mm. So the game continues to surprise me. Uh, I have had incredible fun playing it, even though I've lost. And one of the things that I uh, really recommend about it is that it is pre-programmed in with when you're out of rage, the age is over, you go to the second age, same thing, you go to the third age, game done. And I love a game that can be played in 90 minutes to two hours Set when everybody knows what they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Cool. loving, loving, loving Blood Rage. It's also a great name for a game. It is great, yeah. isn't it? Actually, the thing is, ironically, mm. I did not play this game for the first year it came out because I completely failed to understand that it had to do with Viking and Norse <laughs> mythology because of the title Blood yeah. Rage. I actually was thinking more along the lines of 40K kind yeah. of a thing. And I've done my 40K thing, my Space Marine thing, and it just didn't interest me. There were too many other things out. But had I known it was North mythology, I would have been straight onto it. Um, I love a good four-player game, and this one is phenomenal. So cool. great title, but actually it worked against me. Yeah. That box art is straight out of Iron Maiden, too. It really yeah. is. <laughs> I actually thought it was heavy metal or, sure. or something yeah. like that. Looks yeah. like it. Yeah. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so we're at our meaty topic, and we're going to talk about cinematics and games and what makes a good cinematic, and uh, particularly talking about a cinematic cutscene, although we can talk about cutscenes before the age of cinematics if we'd like to. So the reason why I kind of brought this topic up, honestly, um, it has somewhat some to do with Yakuza 6, because I've been enjoying the game, and it has a lot of cutscenes, and it's sort of... Something that I found interesting in it is the way that the characters are presented, and I should I should preface this by saying I didn't mention it during the button mosh, but players of the series know the game is all subtitled. It's all in Japanese with subtitles. There is no um, English translation, but the localization, the actual translation is actually very good. It's very strong um, in this game, and it tends to be for the series. Uh, the localization team kind of has it as a labor of love, so I do want to point out that these cinematics, if they had a poor translation, would I'm sure not land the way that they have for me um is that an aesthetic choice or a financial choice um my assumption is a little bit of both that makes sense but because honestly it, it it would probably seem kind of weird in this very japanese game to try to find voice actors that would fit the characters well enough mm -hmm. in order to express the very japanese themes that run through the game yeah, yeah. um i think that it, i don't think that it would work honestly um the voice for for kazuma is spot on Mm. Um, so, and a lot of the characters are like that too. Um, I just feel that it would be very difficult to find the right sort of character. Plus they, they bring in for some of these characters, they actually bring in well-known voice, uh, well-known actors. And that's part of what I'd want to talk mm. about with cinematics. One of the actors they bring in is Beat Takeshi. Does anyone mm. know, do you know yeah, Beat Takeshi? Absolutely. Yeah. So he's a very famous Japanese actor and he's known for, um, a whole bunch of, uh, very violent Yakuza films yeah. actually. Um, he also played Zatoichi in a, um, sort of a modern take on the Zatoichi, Zatoichi being a blind samurai. Um, he played him in a sort of a modern take of the blind samurai film, mm -hmm. um, film series. But he also played uh, various gangsters in a lot of different films, hmm. too. And he actually did also play a host of a, a very silly Japanese um, game show called Takeshi's Castle. That's kind of where Wait I first minute. knew him which, from. Which one is he? He is. Um, is he? Is he Kenny Blankenship? No, or he's the, the other, other guy. He's the other guy. What's his name? I've forgotten. Yeah, yeah, from MXC. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From that we, from that the we changed MXC. Yes, he's, he's actually terrible that guy. translation. Yeah. Um, but he's what a, an interesting connection. But he's an excellent actor, um, and he's very intense. And he plays a sort of an older, retired, uh, kind of retired, but not really patriarch of a yakuza family in Onamichi. So the reason why I bring him up is because he was chosen specifically. And by the way, the the. The graphics are good enough. You can tell it is. It's clearly his face, clearly mm. him. It's his voice. Um, the characters based on his sort of mannerisms, um, and they play that up. And one of the things that I particularly like about these cutscenes is that, as opposed to particularly, I do want to compare them to some Western games as well. Um, the cam work is not. Here's a look at the character's face that's talking. 
here's another here, now i'm going to switch over to the other character that's talking and have a static look on their face now i'm going to switch back and have a static look on the other character's face because i see that a lot in games like for example dragon age did that mass effect did that mm -hmm. um it becomes very stale frankly um what they do in this game is they try to put a cinematic a, a cinematic flair to it so that they they um are very mindful of essentially cinematography angles of the shot who like sometimes the person that's talking is not even in the shot purposefully they're showing something else um such as maybe the sky or another character sometimes there's close-ups on someone's face because there's something really important that their eyes are going to show it's obviously something they can't do unless you have a certain level of technology mm -hmm. and i wouldn't say the graphics in this game are excellent but they're good enough to portray this um another series that i think does this really well um smell gear solid I mean, a lot of the games are almost like they're ways to lead you into some of the really interesting cinematic um, sequences. And hmm. um, I sort of want to highlight these games because some of the biggest moments in uh, gaming, like some of the most memorable moments in gaming, when someone talks about, for example, Metal Gear Solid 3, and they talk about the, the scene at the end after you have fought the boss to the death and you have that whole moment where he's at the graves the her gravestone and he's giving her the salute and all that that's the cinematic scene you're not in control really right. you have the whole like you know you do the salute but that's it i mean it is a it's a cut scene mm -hmm. and it's affecting but i think the question that i kind of want to ask y'all and really what i want to discuss is that relationship between the game and the the video game aspect and the cut scene mm -hmm. and because these games are, I would not call them like S FMV games, like the full motion video games from back in the day were basically just video and you mm -hmm. just kind of like had a couple of button interactions. That's not what's going on here. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a lot of complicated gameplay that you have to get through to get to the cutscene. So it's like a mixture of do a whole bunch of complex video gaming, mm -hmm. here's a cutscene. Do a whole bunch of complex video gaming, here's another cutscene. So it's this back and forth that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So, so when does it and when doesn't it? And why? An interesting example that you've made me think of in that was about 10 years ago. It was when the Ghostbusters game came out. Mm. And what was notable was that was the Wii era. And so a version of it came out for Wii. Mm. And of course, the graphics on Wii were never um, intended to be what the graphics on PS3 or um, you know Xbox were. Um, so I guess that would have been what, the 360? No, what, what would that be? Yeah, the yeah, 360, 360 era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so it, it would never, it would, it was never intended to be that on Wii. So what they did was a very, very clever thing. Exact same game, they changed the graphics to mirror the cartoon, the real Ghostbusters cartoon uh, from the what was that late eighties, early nineties? It was, yes. Yeah, and it was the exact same game. Same gameplay, same everything else. Of course, there was some Wii adjustments where you could, you know, you, you get your blaster and you know, what's that thing called? The don't cross the streams. The Wii mote. Uh, yeah. The, the, <laughs> well, the, I meant I meant in in Ghostbusters lore. Oh, oh, um, um, the the proton. The proton packs. Yeah. yeah. So you could use your Wii mote for the proton packs and that and that made it really quite fun, enjoyable. But um, in the sense that it was meant to be a the sequel that they could never make hmm. in terms of movies, it genuinely was Ghostbusters three. Like if you've ever craved for a, uh, you know, maybe you watched the recent one and didn't like it, but if you ever craved for that, you know, third one with the original cast mm. and everything, it was set in, I think, 1998 with the original voice cast mm. and um, the, the whole- The original voice cast from the films or from the cartoon? From the films. Okay. And that's the thing. So, so Bill Murray was actually involved. Yes, they okay. all they all were, and it was actually one of the last projects, as I understand it, um, that Egon did before he died, the, the actor who played Egon. Um, but- all of that is to say this, the aesthetic choice alone changed how people perceived the game. And some people actually really had difficulty accepting the the voice work in the cartoon because it wasn't the cartoon uh, voices. It was the original actors. And those who played what I did, which was the intended to be uh realistic looking graphics for, you know, for PS3, um, really, really enjoyed the experience for the most part, even though we didn't have the Wiimote controls and that kind of a thing. There were tons of cutscenes, and they were all interactive for the most part. Um, and in that sense, I think it really is kind of a transition period over into what we can expect and what we can't, because it was an interactive movie. 
Just mm-hmm. no. So that was specifically meant to be an interactive movie. Yeah, but it, I haven't played the game. I'm, I mean, I mean that in the sense of it was a full on video game with everything you'd expect from a video sure. game. But it was fundamentally it was on a rail. There were tiny little uh, like you go in the hotel and you go anywhere you wanted in the hotel, but you couldn't leave the hotel. You know what I'm saying? And so they revisited all these popular places from the. So it was very restricted. It wasn't like an open. In the way we would think of it in modern terms, yes, very restrictive. In the way that we would have thought of it when the game came out, and oh gosh, it must have been 2009, um, I, I, then we would have thought, wow, this is really a neat transition over into a new era of we can now finally make the games and play the games that are the movies we always wanted but never had. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a little bit, little shades of Ready Player One here is what I'm getting at in the sense of interactive films. All of that is just to say this, whenever we really look at uh, sort of the history of this movement, by which I mean being able to interact in the cutscene and move around in the cutscene, I would go all the way back to Half-Life because I think that one of the things that blew people away about Half-Life was there were cutscenes happening and you could just walk on or you could stop and listen to them. And so much of the game was about stopping the gameplay to listen to the context, but it was a choice. But I would say those weren't cutscenes, though, because mm-hmm. you okay. you had complete control. Okay, so and and I think that the the the, the sort of the, the differentiation that I'm making here is in something like, for example, Metal Gear Solid or Yaku- the Yakuza series. Mm-hmm. The game directors are making a very specific choice about what the camera is on when a certain thing is being said yeah so it is it is the same choice that a director in a film is making when they're putting something on screen they're saying this is what i feel is important for this moment you're saying there's no control at all no okay and just like in a movie if you had control like and and i even talked about this a a while back about watching a film in vr i talked about on the Mm -hmm. show several episodes back that it was essentially a short film a short animated film in vr that you could look wherever you wanted to Mm -hmm. and i didn't like the experience because I was choosing where to look, and therefore I missed a good chunk of the story. Right. And so part of a cinematic, if you're actually making something cinematic, actually cinematic, you have to have control. Like, not you as in the player. The director has to have control of what the per, what the player is seeing because that's how you, you ensure that you're going to get maximum effects. Now, yeah. if you're not a good director, then I, I, in theory it doesn't matter if you're not a good director. Now, with Half-Life 2, I think what they were really trying to do was they wanted to make sure that you didn't have interruptions in gameplay so the story would continue – the story would continue regardless of whether you chose to listen to people talk or not. Well, yeah, that makes some sense. So, so it's, I would argue that Half-Life didn't have cinematics at all for that reason mm-hmm. because you were in complete control. Now, some of what you're saying with, with Ghostbusters, it sounds like they kind of were cinematics, but you had a little bit of control between almost like QTE type control as they were playing. Uh, a little some, different There was from some of that, but Half-Life. honestly, there were some what you would what you would think of as everything freezes in gameplay terms and they show you a little short clip. And then it Ah. it pops back in, like when a ghost would appear kind of a thing. Um, But that said, I I would also point to, say, Assassin's Creed, and by which I mean the original Assassin's Creed, whenever you would have interactive moments of conversation, uh, for example, with your Grandmaster, uh, you could walk around and you could sort of, I would say, orbit him in an arc, but ultimately you were just kind of choosing which direction the camera pointed and it didn't really matter. Right. And I think, I think they, but see, my argument is that that's done when they know, like the, the director or the, or the game team or whatever, (laughs) they don't have any faith in their ability to essentially direct the scene. I think it's done because they don't want the players to get bored watching or listening to a cut scene. So let me ask. Which I think may be the same thing you just said. No, no, no. But yeah, exactly. But because they don't have the ability to do an effective cut scene. Yeah. It's kind of what the topic is about. Like when you go to a movie and you're enjoying the movie, you're not bored because you can't interact with the movie, but you're going to be bored if it's, if it's a bad movie. If it's, if, if, if the, if the, if the cinematography is poor, you're not going to be enjoying, enjoying yourself. So I think that, and, and part of it too, we're talking about an interactive medium. So obviously if you're sitting there and you're watching a cutscene that's 40 minutes long, it's a very different experience mm-hmm. from watching like a couple of minutes of a cutscene. Also, it depends on the, uh, which I think is, is part of what we're talking about here in terms of what makes a good cinematic. It has to be, what you, your choices that you've made leading up to it have to 
support what you're seeing in, in, in that cinematic. That's fair. So even though you don't have control during the cinematic, you feel like you had control leading up to the cinematic. And the reason why it's playing is because you have done something that have, that has caused these – like either your character to act a certain way or other characters to react to your character in a certain way because of something that you did as the player. So that's where the agency comes in when we're talking about cinematics. Well, it sounds like what you're talking about is the difference between just simply – how narrative is told in games versus just simply the utilization of cinematics as one of that form. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. So from that perspective, because otherwise I was going to like, I already had like the first Assassin's Creed in my mind as well. And like you could, you were stuck within like invisible walls, but then Altair could still walk around the room. Yeah. You know, right. Things and like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what document. And I, I feel like that is just to me, not, that's not really a cut scene. That's sure. there. It's, it's like Half-Life two style. Yeah. Only you're yeah. not, you're not able to completely walk away. They're, they're letting you, they're, the story itself is still happening. You're able to engage in the story as in actively pay attention to it if you want to, but it's a choice. I you always, can choose to leave. I always like to turn away from the speaker sure. and have him face the camera. And so <laughs> he, he had his back to the speaker as if he were brooding and thinking about what he was saying. Sure. And I would create my but, own little cinematic but, in that but moment. <laughs> but, so you, but so you created all of that, right? I did, so that yeah. was That was coming from you and not from the... Um, the game itself. Correct. So I, I, that's kind of where I'm getting that, that kind of split between just how much faith they have in their ability to tell a story this way. And I'm not necessarily saying that either is right or wrong, a right mm -hmm. or wrong choice. These are just different. Like, I love Half-Life 2. It's one of my favorite games. Sure. Um, I love the way that they tell their story. So I just feel like these are different ways in which you can tell a story. But my real question would be, when you choose to tell a story in a way that you're going to use cinematics where you actually are saying, I'm going to take away control from the player for a while, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to watch and listen to this scene, when are, like, what interests them and what doesn't? Well, That's kind of what it boils down to. I mean, you just <laughs> said something really significant, I think. Mm -hmm. You are taking away control from the player. Sure. And what that would mean or seem to indicate is that you are shifting them from the role of player to a well in in terms of the like the spectrum an a lesser role of simply being an audience sure. passive audience and so if you do think of it on a spectrum where you give more control and more control and more control somewhere out at the end there is no story at all because everything that you are experiencing is emergent right you know i would i would look at something like um, fortnite as being a great example of being able to tell a single player story variants on a theme, admittedly, but you know some of the videos that are very popular right now and up about that are things like um, you know first player win with no weapons because right. it shows how they won without firing a shot, and, and that would be or a, something like that, right? And that's an example of a player story. Yeah. versus developer story, which is more right. what I'm talking about. Yeah, and so the deep irony in something like that, of course, then, is that what they've done to make it entertaining is to post it on the video. Yes. And and yes. so it's now a set and, canon. But I get what you're saying is that somewhere in that, in that spectrum exists that moment. So you're going video game, video game, movie. And, and the, what's going to happen is your agency, if you do it wrong, your agency is going to come screeching to a halt. Yeah. If you do it right, if I'm understanding your, your proposal here, if you're doing right, actually what's going to happen is even though your control comes to a screeching halt, your agency actually increases. Yes. And, and let's, let's go all the way back to earlier video games because cutscenes are nothing new. Yeah. You go all the way back to the Super Nintendo, even Nintendo days, mm -hmm. there, were, there were some cutscenes in games. And they were, they, they were moments where, sure, you didn't actually play a video that looked real, but your characters reacted and you just had to watch. You couldn't the end of them. every Mario level. Sure. That's one example, but I was thinking more of because that was used more as a, tra a transition. I'm thinking more of something like Chrono Trigger or the Final Fantasy uh, games or other RPGs okay. that had moments where, you know, you really didn't, you weren't, you were not in control. That's very true. But it helped not only tell the story, it helped you connect with the characters mm -hmm. yeah. in a lot in a lot of these. How moments. long was the cutscene in the middle of Final Fantasy VI where everything changed? Like three minutes, four minutes? Yeah, it was pretty long. I mean, it's huge, and that's still, I think, one of the upper upper limits of a cutscene, even today. Yeah, is but around... it's also one of the great moments of video no, game it, history. Totally, and I, and that's kind of what I'm getting yeah. at. You yeah. have something like that, or like, for example, um, when when 
uh, Sifiroth mm-hmm. kills Aerith, which is also a cutscene. Yeah. Um, that was not that long of a scene, but it was very notable. Um, I already mentioned um, Snake saluting Boss's uh, gravestone is another significant yeah. moment. There are a lot of moments in gaming that we think about that are very significant that are actually taking place within a cutscene and not the actual That's gameplay. True. So it's developer story in which they've gone all the way to the other end and taken away control. And it's still very memorable, but of, yeah. cor- of course there's moments on the other end. But um, I think what makes that so memorable is not, like if you play it without context, I don't think it has that reaction. Well, that's no, certainly sure. true, yeah. You, 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 instead of having like a film, for example, like I don't think Final Fantasy VII, let's use that example, mm-hmm. right? Because everybody's played that game, um, I think, at this point. So let's use Final Fantasy VII. I don't think it would work very well as a film. And maybe some people go, yeah, it would work great because it's got a good story. I disagree, and I don't know why I did like a yokel voice there. Sorry, um, but but no, but I disagree well, Jim, because I think the story of the game is helped because it is a video game. It's a game. That's why I think the story works um, because you are in control of, of of your characters to a degree, and the story that they're telling becomes your story. Yeah, and yeah. you you connect much more greatly with the characters, including Aerith. Over the course of that story, you you play for what is it? Maybe your first playthrough, maybe. 10 hours at least before she dies at least something like yeah. that yeah so that's and now if that was if that was a film and you think about when in the story she gets killed yeah it would be maybe a third of the way through the movie mm-hmm. would you really connect with that character in a film in, in that little bit of time well, i don't think so if it's done right but it'd have to be done really well and frankly we, if you think about the way that it was done in terms of the actual developer story strip away anything else mm-hmm. and try to condense that down to like maybe I guess it would be like 20 minutes of a movie. Yeah. I don't think they could do that and have that at effect because the story itself, a lot of what was what made that that so powerful was that you had player story connection to that character mm-hmm. yeah. that, that they didn't tell you about, but it was like you're in a battle and she saves your ass because she casts some like, you know, mm-hmm. healing spell and you're like, whoa, yeah, awesome. You know, those things like that that happen to you as you're playing the game that and some of the choices that you make and some of the stories that you're able to make some choices in, um, like the, you know, Claude going on a date scene in, in uh, the one casino, I forget the name of that, Gold something. I don't remember the uh, town, but yeah, uh, that but was yeah. before then, yeah, right. Yeah. So you have all these different different moments that you are in, you have some control. So you have the player story element that you add to the to the developer story, and it's that it's in that marriage that makes the cinematic so powerful. And I think you see that in Yakuza as well. You have moments where, um, and they do a great job of lead, of wanting you like building up a character like an enemy. And making you hate them in a, in a short period. Like they come in, um, just here's an example, the way the game starts. The game starts in media res, right? It's in, it, They kind of do this thing where, and you don't know how long it's going to take until you get to that point. I'm already past it. But um, a character, wa- Kiru's sitting there at a bar and he's looking badass as always. And he's just drinking like a, you know, just like a, a glass of, of scotch or whiskey or something like that inside inside a glass dark liquor and this guy breaks into the you just bust into the into the bar and he's really angry at kiru you don't recognize the character which mm-hmm. is different because yakuza mm-hmm. usually they, they reuse a lot of the same characters this game actually has almost an entirely new cast hmm. and um you don't know you don't recognize this person he's calling kiru out and you're like oh this guy's in trouble and he keeps calling him out and he's just sitting there and the guy comes up and kiru's drinking and like doesn't even acknowledge him and he just slaps the drink out of his hand and at that moment you hear the baby cry and before Kiru doesn't care, he's not going to fight the guy. He hear you hear the baby cry, and Kiru and Kiru has this reaction of like, you know, you're not gonna like. I can't believe you made my baby cry kind of reaction. Like now it's on, sort of thing. Like you, <laughs> you've pissed off granddad. Here he goes. I, I've been so, there actually. Right. So <laughs> don't wake the baby, man. Yeah. So now, now he's pissed, and you as the player, you're you're. This is just you have no control at this moment, but you're heated up. I mean, I got heated up. I'm heated up. I'm like, I'm going to beat the crap out of this guy because through the, 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 the cinematic, now I'm ready. I'm in. I have a reason to fight this guy. It's not just a random person. Mm-hmm. And then you go out and you, now you have control and now you fight him. And the reverse is done a lot too, where you, you get into a fight with someone for, for some reason that is a lot of it player story. And then after that, there might be a cutscene that adds extra context or gives you a different angle on it or a different perspective etc so i feel like that's where it's that marriage between your choices the player story and the developer story in which you don't really have a choice in in that aspect of the game but when you put those together that's how you get a great i don't think it's the only way you can get a great uh, story in games but i think that's how you can get a great story in games yeah yeah that makes sense i I would actually pick on a franchise that i love Mm. assassin's creed in that it's so 
mm, easy in many of the games, not all of them, uh, but in many of them to go find your target, take them out, do the thing. It has the cut scene. And then he's like, yes, if you had not been so evil, then this would not have happened to you. Well, you do not know the truth. It is. A, and, and there's, and I'm like, who is this guy? And why did I kill him? I don't know. <laughs> Moving on. What's the next mission? I would argue that Origins actually does a really great job of not doing that hmm. um, to the point where it only reveals the first four and you think you're about to go, uh, you know, kill number three and you meet up with your wife and she's like, yeah, I took care of those last two. And they just X off in like in the, in the meta screen, like in the, in the sub screen. It's brilliant. And it's like, what, what, huh? It's a game over. And and then you get this little thread about these other, um, and oh, you think you really killed the so-and-so? No, no. There's actually six men who are the so-and-so. And it's it just, it really takes it to a cool place. Comparatively, given that it's like the eighth game in the series, the you know main mainline game in the series. So um, I, I get what you're saying. I really do. There needs to be meaningful context, but I think there's probably a, balance oh no definitely i think that of course if you have too much cutscene, then you get into the uh, what we used to have um back in there's this period in the 90s and i mentioned it briefly where we had um fm like the, the you know full motion video was really big and we had games that were nothing but full motion video what was that that system i think it was a 3do i yeah, want to say yeah that just had a bunch of those games where it was literally you're just cd-rom technology yeah, yeah. you're just watching a video and you have a little bit of control mm -hmm. during the video, like a little bit of choice of the video, but you're essentially watching an interactive movie. Yeah. And at that point, you're not really playing a game. It's an interactive movie. There yeah. was this cool game back in the day for well, 386 era, uh, 486 era. It was called Murder in the First. And what was amazing about it was it had actual full motion video, but mm. they had kind of cheated a little bit because obviously small video is easier to to render than large video, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, the, so it's a smaller file size. So what they'd done was they'd had a still image, and then in a part of the still image they would have the character, and then that's where like the background would remain the same, but that's where mm -hmm. the video would take place, and it 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 felt right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I just remember those transition type of moments in, in games. And to compare that to what we have now, it's in, incomparable. You, right. you, you cannot compare it. And I, there, there's a concerted effort for sure in a lot of games, particularly AAA games nowadays, to try to mimic a lot of the, the style of a film. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I've... I have definitely come down pretty hard against that in a lot of, um, a lot of episodes because... I do feel strongly that games are, are their own medium, are able to stand on their own two feet, um, have their own way of telling stories. And I still believe that. But I also believe that you can still use cinematics. You can still use things that you learn from cinema, yeah. just like video games use things that they learn from traditional games, just like video games use things that, that we learn from um music, telling stories through sound and music that that oh, you hear good inside. Connection. Mm -hmm. Um especially concept albums for one thing, but just, just a song in general. Yeah. So video games are really a marriage of all of these different, um, not just forms of entertainment, but forms of art. And it's all this kind of like beautiful connection. When it's done right, yeah. it's this beautiful connection that mm -hmm. forms its mm -hmm. own art that you can look at and you could look at any one particular element and go, wow, this, this part is art. And sometimes you look at everything and how it fits together holistically and go, oh, this itself the game everything about it is also art and sometimes you're like uh eh, it's it sucks but the but the graphics are awesome or like the music is great <laughs> right. or like i really love how the combat works but damn the story's bad so you have that too i mean that's course, that's part that's part of games because it's hard to have all those things be great all at the same a lot time of moving parts lots of moving parts um but i think when it when it's when it's working well it can be it can be great and i think it can be some of the most affecting uh, one of the most affecting, if not the most affecting forms of media, because while you can still have those great moments in a film, you definitely can, when you add in the element of having some control and some additional background to those characters and to those events that you see, and you feel like you're extra invested because you had you played a role in it, regardless of how much you actually could have done. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, in your story, you still, the story would have played out regardless of how you personally approached it. But because you had some of that agency for part of it, when you get to those cutscenes, it you are providing so much extra context and extra emotion to it 
that it changes your perception and makes it much more meaningful. Yeah, I, I guess that then um, my question uh, for you would be what what can de designers and developers do to make that feel quote unquote right? Because, you know, one of the things that we brought up earlier was, uh, you know, the when we when we consider like kind of when cutscenes really started to what I consider like kind of the the golden era of cutscenes of like kind of the PS1 PS2 kind of time time period right yeah um, yeah well, they and, were definitely definitely video like yeah. clearly video right like yeah, not it, not game graphics but video yeah right? and a lot of times uh you know i think japanese games did this a lot and they were oftentimes um if they were like middle Gear solid they would maybe do cg but a lot of times like especially in jrpgs they'd be animated um and because that would be really easy to just simply put onto a disc um not necessarily cheap to do, but easy to do. Sure. Um, we saw, we see, saw, saw some of that recently in Persona, Persona 5. Yeah, yeah. and so I guess that kind of the point that I'm getting at is they started doing that early because we, we talk about games like a Final Fantasy VII or like kind of early uh, or like even Chrono Trigger where a lot of times there was a story that they wanted to tell that they couldn't tell with the presentation of the game itself um, because it would have been really hard to theatrically actually like express these scenes via pixels. Really? I, I, at least I personally feel. I, I, I think that um, I, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you per se. I just find it interesting that you made that statement but also brought up Chrono Trigger, which actually did successfully do it with Pixels. Or did you only ever play the PlayStation Chrono Trigger? You yes. never played the Super yeah. Nintendo? Right. So I Well, actually, no. I played the DS version. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So, but you've played it. Yeah. So you remember the anime cutscenes. Yes. Have you ever played yeah. it without them? No. Because I have only played it without them yeah and it's one of the most to me emotionally affecting games i've played well and i definitely even don't think that you can't i'm just curious that. i'm not like I'm not i mean saying you're there's wrong. even recent just, games i mean even yeah. like uh uh the 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 pixel game uh hyperlight drifter did that as well yes. i mean you 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 can do oh, it i agree but... i definitely agree with you that it's harder yeah because it requires it requires more and that's kind of what we're getting at too it's like it it requires imagination from the player exactly and it requires you to have the additional um, buy-in to sort of to to bring a lot of that extra context and um, to the scene itself and you're sort of playing out what's happening not just on screen but sort of like the theater of the mind so to speak yes whereas with a cinematic that the that the the game director has decided to make they're making all those those choices so when you're talking about a you know a cutscene in say some of the old you know, like a super nintendo game or a, or a nes or like a Genesis or something, it's a little more akin to what Doc brought up before with, um, you know, he chose to set, um, I don't even know the character's name, whichever Assassin's Creed you, you were using this for, where you had the character turn turn away when the cutscene was going on. So all it looked of like them he was rooting. The okay, all yeah, of them. Yeah. So, but you did that for a reason and you kind of created your own little extra context to the story. It's almost like that. Not quite, but it's well, almost like in those, in right. Games, but, yeah. but my point is that he's, he, you do have to bring some of your imagination to it yes. for some of the context. I feel that if you're telling the story right, it can still work that way. Sure. But yeah, absolutely. I see what you're saying. But, but it, the, it gives the, you that extra the, element. The yeah. point being that that was really kind of what, that was an era in which we knew that we could start to, with this new technology, start to tell stories more cinematically mm -hmm. and that then kind of became the standard for a long time and as technology has still come along and it's as kind of our understanding of how to tell narrative in games has come along and evolved as well we've especially in the AAA scene we've continued to kind of latch on to still that old convention um and so you know in that like you bring up a persona or like even if we talk about um I don't know, pick a game that utilizes cutscenes today. I mean, Metal, Yakuza 6, or if you, I know you have, I know you haven't played that, but what about Metal Gear Solid 5? Sure. Came yeah. out a few years ago? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess that in a lot of times we still have those same issues of, I don't like the controller being taken out of my hand in these situations. I feel that they should come along with a better way to do this. And I think that there are some developers that are doing it, but my, I'm, I'm less interested in my answer in that. And I am interested to know, especially somebody who, uh, has is bringing up Yakuza as, as one of these examples that's done it right. What exactly is it that seems to make that work for you? And what do what does the game need to do to be able to emphasize that? Well, I, I think, so what makes it work is, like I said, it, the game provides context through playing. So like to use an example, let's say you're in a boss fight in Yakuza and it does, they do this in, in all the games that I've played at least. So Zero, Kiwami, and now Six. Um, 
the fights are very typically very intense. Like I just got through a boss fight where I'm fighting the the boss of uh, um, you know the, the Chinese uh, triad, and he's this really big burly guy, and you have to fight a bunch of his minions at the same time. And um, at one point, you get his health, and they do this. It's kind of a convention they do in Yakuza. You whittle the boss's health down to a certain trigger point, and when you do, it triggers a brief cutscene that takes you to the next um, segment of the fight. And so you do something that the game itself you couldn't really do in the game, but e and even if you could do, you may not do it. So they're making that choice of. Um, in this case, I was on the third floor at first. I picked him up and I threw him over the railing, and now we're fighting on um, the cross beams on the roof, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so we have a little bit more of a fight on the cross beams, right? And then I pick him up, and um, once I you know trigger a point again, I pick him up and I throw him off the cross beams, and he crashes down into a table, and I jump off dramatically and land next to him, mm -hmm. and then the boss fight continues. These are things that while they could introduce the the ability to let you do some of these interesting things and by the way they do in normal fights you can do things like for example completely optionally um you can if someone's attacking you and you trigger your heat move at the right moment and you're inside a convenience store you can throw their head if you're close enough to it into a microwave crash it through the microwave and then um tell the attendant who's right there as part of the cutscene to turn on the microwave while his head is in there, essentially like shock him or something. And then that takes the guy out, right? So you, it did that because I chose to do it and the fight becomes a lot more cool and dramatic because I was able to trigger this one scene that was completely optional. Yeah. But when you're in certain parts of the game, like for example, in this one boss fight, there were so many of these moments they wanted to make sure that you had that were very much inspired by, um, in this case, Japanese action films. Yeah, it's the genre. Right. They're yeah. trying to get to evoke that um, style. And in order to do that, they need to make sure that these sort of events are happening. So either they either you either they, they force them to happen. In this case, they did or they don't. And if they don't, then it's like, well, maybe the player will get to see this cool thing, but probably not unless because because frankly, at this point, I've done so many side quests that my that my Kiru is a complete badass and I would have killed that guy pretty damn quick and would have never seen anything cool because of how over I'm kind of overpowered right now kind of over leveled myself a little bit mm -hmm. I'm a little, I feel a little bad about it but I would have never seen anything like that it would have been significantly less cool I over level now, everything so yeah, you're kind yeah, of speaking my language right. here um I just got two into the side quest but because of that I would never have experienced that cool fight, but now I have so many memories, and I could talk probably for like 20 minutes about that one boss fight, yeah. how many cool memories I have. So that's what I think the issue is. Like, yeah. you, I don't think you can really do that without cutscenes. Now, to be fair, those cutscenes I'm talking about, they're brief. It's like 10 seconds at yeah, most. Yeah. So I'm not talking about a super long scene in that example. Um, for the longer scenes, for things that are longer, um, where it's exposition, I think it comes to if you have a story in which that you're telling that has a lot of of plot twists and ex and exposition and like a lot of these sort of like um, background that needs to be told, especially when it doesn't involve the main character, because there are a lot of cutscenes in this in Yakuza Six that don't involve the main character. There are mm -hmm. things that are happening presented like a movie, like oh by the way, here's what this character is doing while Kiru's off doing this. That's where the cutscene I think comes in a lot of time. So it sounds like at its core, what at least in this particular example, what makes it work and maybe we could consider in other games as well is um, a synergy between all elements of the game yes. um, and creating the expectation for the audience that um, expects for cutscenes to come in and complement, not necessarily detract from the story. Um, you know, that that's where we get things like in, say, on uh, my experience with Uncharted 4, for example. Um, I just wanted that game to just be cutscenes, and I just wanted to watch the movie that was that really? game. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the rest of that game did not complement anything that was happening in the cutscenes for me personally. Mm -hmm. uh, most I've of that gameplay, before, most yeah. of that gameplay, yeah. and I'm a huge Uncharted fan, most of the gameplay in Uncharted 4 was shooting people which of course never fits the rest of uncharted story right. or rock climbing and this had way more climbing and rock climbing than any previous uncharted oh, game wow. um and i just wanted to get to the story about nathan and elena and their marriage and i found that really interesting mm. and of course nothing in the game had mm -hmm. anything to do with that but with uh yakuza what it sounds like that they seem to do well is um utilizing a lot of trigger events that are in actual gameplay yes. to do small cutscenes. Um, kind of the tone of the game that they seem to have as well um, to prepare the player for the cutscenes that are a little bit longer expositional or narrative driven. 
and coming up with a way to make sure that the character and all of the side characters that there's not any type of narrative dis- narrative dissonance between the way that the player will play the main character and how he's going to act in this in the actual cutscenes themselves and vice versa with any of the other characters so there seems to be a lot of synergy there mm-hmm. of allowing that complementary nature um and ensure that there's not any dissonance there that is a really good observation yeah. No. My, that, my, that was perfectly said. My thoughts <laughs> um, for a while now in this area have related to the idea of authenticity and validity, and that's my model, uh, is the authenticity validity model uh, for game design. And I think that this plays right into it. And I would argue, using those terms and the way that I've defined them in the past, that whenever you're giving the player the freedom to do stuff their own way, that, that is lending authenticity to a scene. But that whenever you are then uh, leaning more towards what we would call dev story or pre-scripted story, that that's going to have the validity of the story that is consistent across your playthrough and my playthrough. That that always the main character does this one thing. Geralt always does this one thing when you get to a certain point. I think what we're missing here, too, and because we keep talking about character names, and I feel that this sort of story, like I'm just like... Yakuza only works because I'm not playing myself as a Yakuza in this world. That's I'm playing true. Kiru Kazuma. That's and he a has really a good very point. clear way that he acts. And same thing with, with Witcher 3. Which I'm is glad validity. you brought it up. Yeah. Same yeah. deal. You're Geralt of Rivia. You're not, you know, Doc Bracken yeah, playing that's a, really a, good point. a Witcher. Well, Would, what needs to be important in there as well is that there are no options that the player is even given to break that character right. as well. Right. Right. Uh, not, not like, say, Fortnite, which... Side note, uh, kind of funny, I actually spent about five minutes when I first loaded up Fortnite because I was trying to ca- change my character and I didn't realize that it's randomly generated every time you start it. <laughs> nice. And so I was like, listen, I have nothing against this particular character, but I do find it interesting that the default is a black woman, which doesn't really suit my personal uh, avatar person you know selection and five minutes i had to google the thing (laughs) because i didn't want to get locked into something because you know sometimes you you can change it at the beginning but then you're you're set right yeah um and so i i just i finally figured out okay it's gonna it's gonna randomize it every time i play got it um unless you you know buy the custom skins which of course is how they're making their money right now so but that's a different rant uh yeah so those are my final thoughts actually is that uh you know whenever you need to make a specific choice narratively, I think that a cut scene is a great way to do that. Um, whether it be a cinematic or call it an interactive cut scene. But I think that if it really doesn't matter, that one of the great ways to go with it is to do it in gameplay. I agree. Totally. So I think that, I think that that's, I completely agree. That's it's, my it's, final thought. Yeah, I completely agree. It's got, it's gotta be a, um, a choice that you're making because that's the way that that's the best way to tell that part of the story. Yeah. 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 I, I completely agree with that. If, um, uh, as, as somebody who's played a lot of games with cutscenes and I'm fans of them, um, in certain situations, uh, ironically, I can't stand anymore. The idea of a, I, I hate that feeling of when the controller has to be put down and I think to myself, I don't like having to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet there's a lot of games that I feel I never actually end up doing that with. And I think that's where that harmony comes in that we've been talking about today that I've never really considered before. Um, I I feel that what, what needs to happen and the important element of this discussion or that any designer should think about is, does narrative even have to be in my game? And if so, yeah. then we either need to create synergy between the gameplay and the narrative or come up with a new gameplay system that makes the narrative work yeah yeah right um you know i I think of something like one of the better stories recently it's a relatively simple story but one of the better stories that i've played recently in a game was uh i guess it was a year ago now was uh oxen free and that was because what it did was it was a mechanic system that was built around how people actually dialogue and it felt natural and there was nothing else that got in the way of it. Um, If I went and fought zombies and punched and it had like, you know, combat in it, that would have been a very different Mm -hmm. game. And then the narrative wouldn't have affected it nearly as much. Um, So I think that that's kind of at its core, what it comes down to is not necessarily that cutscenes that take you away from gameplay, even for a really prolonged period of time, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you have prepared the audience for that and created the right type of game in which 
that fits the interactive mm-hmm. nature of the mm-hmm. game. Right. Uh, thank you, backward compatible listeners, for joining us for our discussion on uh, what makes a good cinematic in video games. Nothing is the answer. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Eric. And uh, we'll see you next week. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. I, I want to do my I'm Doc again. Sure. I'm Doc. There we go. Uh, I'm Doc. There you go. We're yeah. going to splice that in. Yeah, whatever. Let's let's all be Doc. I'm Doc. I'm Doc. I'm Jim. <laughs> I'm Eric. I am Guy's Baltar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brian of Nazareth, and so is my wife. I am Spodicus. <laughs> Please cut all that out. We love you, Chris. I don't.